Francesca, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Now, Lauren and I, we were talking earlier today about how to even begin this conversation because there's so much that we want to talk to you about. <laughs> so I'm going to do something, maybe it's cheating a little, I'm going to read back some of your own words to you. Oh. This is from a paper that you published in the past year. Oh, um, I don't know if I like this. <laughs> I think you'll like it. I, I hate to hear my own things. Well, let's say it in my voice. <laughs> the words are, understanding space, time, and matter in the early universe brings us to the edge of our knowledge, and it is there that philosophy and experience must meet. Yep. So there's so much there. There's space, time, matter, philosophy, uh, and this is why we struggled to come up with the sort of questions to ask you, because these are such big topics. And these questions are not just uh, in the air as uh, pure philosophical questions, are mm -hmm. about uh, uh, what we actually observe in the universe and how we make sense of the reality, a reality that uh, we check through our experiments. So, yeah, it's, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we talk about uh, philosophy and we say, oh, but this is just philosophy, as to say something is uh, disconnected from our experience, but actually for me it's the opposite. It's philosophy that enters uh, to help us, to give us tools to explain what we see. So that's exactly why I wanted to bring up this quote. It, it introduces these ideas, particularly theoretical physics and, and, and fundamental science, which is our, our wheelhouse here at Perimeter Institute, but philosophy as well, which often is thought of as something separate and different, but you're bringing them together. And, and can you tell us how and why? Well, but this is a prejudice of our time. Mm -hmm. uh, physics and philosophy were born together. So if we think about the ancient uh, Greek uh, natural philosophers, uh, they were uh, the first philosophers, but they were also called the philicists because the kind of questions they were asking were about uh, uh, what is matter, what is the world made of, uh, what is the universe. Uh, um, so we are in the same tradition. We are just continuing to ask the same questions. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there are differences with respect to what those philosophers were doing because then we learned uh, uh, to add mathematics. Uh, uh, this came later with Pythagoras. We uh, learned that we need, uh, we, we have the possibility to make experiments. Uh, we learned this with Galileo later, and so on. Uh, we are sharpening our tools, we are acquiring new tools, but in the end, the questions are always the same. We are always here asking, what is being, what is becoming? Actually, these two are the questions that motivate me. And uh, I, if I have to uh, single out the single questions I wanted to really see answer in my life is really what is being and what is becoming. Hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's also the connection for me with philosophy. So when I was studying philosophy in high school, uh, I met these kind of questions. I met this way to formulate these questions. I mean, we are all hunted by these questions. Uh, but um, through philosophy, I discovered a way in which we can uh, uh, put these questions in a clear manner and uh, we can proceed step by step to try to answer. We can uh, dissect the questions in pieces uh, and try to answer step by step. That, that division between philosophy and, and physics, uh, that, that's, you say, maybe a, it's counter-historical in a way. Yeah. When did they separate? When, when did we develop this modern bias that these are two different spheres? I think this is something very recent, because if you think uh, even to the fathers uh, of uh, modern physics, uh, uh, like, uh, I mean, I, I work in quantum gravity, so the father of uh, gravity, general relativity is Einstein, uh, the, the fathers of quantum mechanics are people like Bohr or Heisenberg, and uh, they were very proficient in philosophy. Uh, Einstein used to have uh, a philosophy book by Schopenhauer on his uh, uh, bed, tab uh, bed table, so um, all these people who made uh, great uh, revolutions uh, in physics, uh, they were uh, embedded in the philosophy of their time. They were inspired, very explicitly inspired by the philosophy of their time. Einstein would be able uh, um, to take the steps that he was taking uh, without being inspired by Mack. And uh, very importantly, Mack was also the same philosopher who inspired the quantum revolution. So the idea that um, we have to proceed uh, looking at uh, what is observed um, and rely on it uh, um, is what allowed 
uh, Eisenberg to write uh, the, the first uh, uh, matrix mechanics in which, uh, okay, I, don't, I wanted to be agnostic, I wanted just to, to fill up a table with the observations that I make, and then I will construct the theory. So I think that uh, the, uh, the division between physics and philosophy is something really, uh, it's a bit of a pathology for, of a brief uh, period in our of our time, mm. uh, but now that uh, uh, we are facing new questions in physics, like in my case with quantum gravity, if you wanted to construct uh, a new theory, a theory beyond what we know, especially since uh, uh, observations uh, gets more and more difficult uh, to be obtained, mm -hmm. we really need uh, to use philosophy. Uh, we need uh, philosophy, what, what philosophy does for us uh, is to sharpen our conceptual tools. Uh, it's like uh, a cleaning of our ideas. Uh, it, it, it tells us what are the ideas uh, that uh, are necessary to think the world in a certain way according with what we observe and what are the ideas that instead we have imported that, that maybe are there for historical reasons, but we can, uh, um, we don't have to keep with us. That uh, in, in philosophical terms we say some ideas are dispensable. Mm -hmm. We can make uh, without them. So uh, there is this. Uh, uh, so philosophy is this uh, sharpening tool. Yeah, <laughs> is this sharpening tool. Mm -hmm. So as you're saying, maybe these I, these questions really do need to be considered from both physics and philosophers yeah. at the same time. But unfortunately today, those areas are sometimes considered quite separate. And I know you yourself have to split your time between many different departments <laughs> and institutes. So you're a member of the Department of Philosophy, the Department of Physics at Western University. You're also a member of the Rotman Institute for yeah. Philosophy and the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. So I assume the day-to-day -day experience that you have must depend a lot on what institute or what department <laughs> you're in at the time and the types of conversations that you have must be so different because you're surrounded by such different people. Can you tell us about these different environments and what they bring to your research? I don't know. Uh, it's all always me. <laughs> <laughs> you're the constant I, I, am, I am this person. Of, I have, if you want, multiple identities, but <laughs> it's always me. Um, I was thinking about uh, a conversation I had uh, with a very good uh, friend of mine uh, with which I did my PhD. And we were like uh, the yin and yang, the two opposites. Uh, um, there are two ways in which you do physics and they are both very fruitful. So my friend uh, is a genius. Uh, he knows uh, how to treat any systems using the tools of statistical mechanics. And we had this conversation one day, I remember walking together and it was, and we were like saying, okay, so uh, what I like to do is that uh, I have these tools, these mathematical tools that I know very well how to use and I can apply them everywhere. So now I'm doing quantum gravity, but I can apply this to uh, mathematical evolution uh, or biology or uh, even economics. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't see myself as being bounded by uh, my identity as a physicist because I can apply this uh, to so many different uh, uh, questions. And for me, I was thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm not so technically good as he is, but then uh, for me, the drive comes from questions. So I've been haunted by this question, what is being, what is becoming, what is the universe, what are we made of? And uh, for me, the center is the question. And then I go around, uh, I, I started my career uh, uh, studying uh, uh, astronomy because I wanted to work in cosmology, but then I realized, okay, I need more mathematics. I need to learn theoretical physics. Uh, so I went to look for tools there. I, I went to learn uh, all the most advanced uh, topics in um, theoretical physics. Uh, and then, but I needed philosophy. So I went to talk with philosophers. And then I needed the inspiration from art to think the, the world from a different perspective. So for, for, so for me, these central questions are my identity, if you want. But then, uh, again, they are not constraints. They are a way to open myself to everything and to look around me. I, I was talking at lunch with somebody working uh, in uh, quantum computing. Uh, I have been uh, talking with people uh, working in so many different uh, uh, environments in, on different questions than mine. But, uh, 
I keep the curiosity <laughs> about what they are doing because I can always relate it to the question I'm interested in and try to use it. Sometimes the use is direct, like I can learn a new mathematical uh, technique and use it directly. Some other time is just the inspiration because you never know <laughs> where it will come from, right? Mm -hmm. So you just walk, you see a piece of art, you see somebody doing a trick with a skateboard and it's like, aha, yes, <laughs> this is what I needed uh, to, to see the world differently. Yeah. And I, I know that you hold the Canada Research Chair in Foundations yeah. of Physics. And I think this is such an interesting term, Foundations of Physics, because it, you know, from the title, it's clearly the kinds of ideas that everything else is built upon. Is this how, is this kind of a guiding principle in your work that you try to think about what everything else, it, what is needed to build all these other fields? Yeah, maybe it is indeed the, the way in which I see things that um, I needed to start from the building blocks to understand then uh, how things uh, uh, behave in the larger setting. Uh, so, Sometimes, uh, again, uh, we, we all have different uh, learning styles, uh, different cognitive styles. Some people learn by specific examples. Uh, I learn from uh, basic uh, ideas, and then I, I, I needed to go and enlarge my knowledge and look at examples later. So for me, <laughs> it's really a necessity. It's a cognitive necessity to, to work on the foundation of physics, because without them, I wouldn't be able to think about any other specific problem in physics. Uh, I should say something about foundations of physics because there are some misunderstandings about uh, what it is. Some, uh, it's, uh, it's re of course, a, a part uh, of the research in physics uh, that uh, overlap with philosophy. So people working in the foundations are either physicists or philosophers, or are, they are actually, most of the time, people who are both. <laughs> like you? And, you know, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't call myself, I don't dare call myself a philosopher yet. Really? I, it's like, okay, I, I took 15, 20 years, I don't know how much to call myself a physicist. I think another 20 years of practice, maybe one day I will call myself a philosopher. <laughs> I don't dare for the moment. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, because you uh, teach philosophy, but there's a difference between... I, I, I have grown an enormous respect for my colleagues and my students. The more I interact with them, the more I'm amazed, again, by how the philosophy training teach you to be sharp and to be able to dissect things. I, I'm amazed by them. So, mm -hmm. But I'm not yet there. Mm -hmm. I try to give my perspective from the perspective of somebody practicing physics. Mm -hmm. I think there is a value in this, in interacting with people uh, that don't have directly the experience of doing physics and doing research. Well, yeah, I'm not yet a philosopher. <laughs> uh, so coming, coming back to the question of the foundations of physics, uh, uh, it's a bit like philosophy. There is a lot of misunderstanding on what it means to do foundation of physics. Uh, um, Foundation of physics is really a, a reflection. Uh, it's a very specific uh, subject, uh, and it's a reflection about uh, all uh, the uh, tools uh, that we use uh, in physics. Uh, for instance, uh, why do we use the Hilbert space in quantum mechanics? Uh, why do we use a manifold uh, in general relativity? Are these uh, mathematical structures uh, capturing some element of reality? Are they uh, really essential in uh, in um, in the description of the physics out there in the reality out there. Um, how should we understand them? Um, how different formulations of the theory are capturing different aspects of uh, physics, and so on. So, uh, people working in the foundations are often. Uh, extremely proficient in all the mathematical details uh, uh, of all our physical theories. Uh, they, uh, they are even closer to mathematicians sometimes mm -hmm. than physicists because of that. Uh, but of course, in our daily life, especially uh, when we want to do an experiment and so on, uh, we don't really think about uh, what, what uh, the different mathematical tools that are behind our theory means. Mm -hmm. and, and we can do without. I mean, there is nothing bad in this. Uh, you don't need to look at all the details uh, when you do an experiment. Uh, if you work with uh, your um, optical uh, device, uh, you can 
take uh, measurements uh, and uh, you don't have to ask uh, to, to remember the Hilbert space <laughs> that mm -hmm. there is behind that. Uh, but again, there are people who are specializing in thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And these questions uh, are interesting, uh, not just to understand the theories uh, that uh, we use already, but also for the sake of building new theories. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you mean by the questions, what is being and what is becoming, and how does that connect to the work that you're doing? You've mentioned quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. How does quantum gravity tackle those questions? Well, what is becoming means uh, uh, also what is time. What do we mean by evolution? Right. So, of course, uh, um, understanding uh, time is something that comes up uh, already at the level of uh, um, general relativity because mm -hmm. uh, the way in which we understand the time there changes. Now, time is a very loaded word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, when we think about general relativity, we are talking about some very specific uh, aspects of it. Uh, so there, are, there is a sense in which time disappears from the equation. It becomes, uh, what do we say, it's just a gauge. So it's mm -hmm. something that uh, um, we can uh, put aside. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that there is no evolution. In fact, uh, it's the opposite. So this uh, point of view makes you think that uh, Everything uh, uh, is change. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so, but then the question is okay, but why there is change in the world? What is making it? Um, and uh, uh, I think that uh, this is something very deep. It's present in the structure of the theories uh, we uh, work with. Uh, for instance, in mechanics, uh, we, we look at uh, uh, the theory in terms of uh, a position and momentum. Uh, so position, you can see it as the, what we, we call being, mm -hmm. what is there, and uh, the momentum, what is becoming. Right. And uh, they are uh, dual to one another. Um, we have a lot of this kind of dualities in modern physics, uh, and I would like to understand these dualities better. So how is it that uh, in the theory that, uh, uh, in the fundamental theories, in their mathematical structure, I can uh, uh, exchange being with becoming in such a fluid way? What is telling us about what change is, uh, mm -hmm. what is telling us about uh, the fundamental role that uh, change play, uh, plays in uh, what we call reality. Because uh, you realize the fact that uh, when you say that something is there, like a particle, it's always the case that you have to say this uh, when there is some interactions. So, mm -hmm. so in interactions, again, means that something is changing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so you see how these two things are completely intertwined. They cannot be separated. So this gives you a completely new perspective uh, with respect to these uh, very ancient philosophical questions, uh, because you cannot separate being and becoming anymore, and you have to find uh, a new way to think of them uh, as dual to one another. Mm -hmm. You know, we actually, we, we get questions from students, and there's a question that we got from a student named uh, Kira, I believe is how you pronounce her name, and I think it cuts pretty deep into the big question of, of quantum gravity, so maybe we can play that mm -hmm. for you. Hi Francesca, I'm Kira from grade 7. My question is, how does Einstein's general relativity work at the quantum level, and how do you relate that to quantum theory? <laughs> oh my god! I told yeah, you it this cuts is deep. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they're not messing around with these questions. These are good questions. <laughs> so despite the fact that uh, we have grown with this mantra that uh, quantum gravity is uh, about uh, the fact that uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics uh, are two separate worlds, uh, I think that uh, there is a common ground in which you see how they fit perfectly uh, together. And uh, they are bringing the same message uh, about the fundamental reality, that is that reality is uh, uh, relational, is always relational. Um, so uh, what we see in quantum mechanics uh, is the fact that uh, uh, we see uh, 
we, we can make different measurements. An observer uh, could measure spin up, and uh, another observer can measure spin down uh, at the same time. And uh, uh, the two things are not in contradiction with one another. They stay together in quantum mechanics because uh, different observers can have uh, a different perspective uh, on, on what the system is doing, can have different interactions with a given system. So uh, every element of reality always comes with a label with respect to what observer is producing it, let's mm -hmm. say, through an interaction. On the other hand, um, General relativity is the prototypical relational theory in which uh, um, nothing depends anymore on coordinates, on pre-established coordinates, on pre-established uh, space and time. The only way in which we can tell that something has happened is with respect to a given clock and a given rods. So again, every time you make uh, a measurement, so you say that there is an event, this should come with a coincidence uh, between uh, um, uh, I don't know, a, a certain uh, um, something happening uh, at the same time when uh, something else is there, or when, uh, I don't know, when two observers uh, meet, uh, let's say. And this is how you define a given localization. So I think uh, that uh, it's these relational aspects, uh, highlighting these relational aspects bring, really brings uh, uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics uh, together in, in a very powerful conceptual way. Now, technically, <laughs> how mm -hmm. do you do this? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, I work on a theory that is called loop quantum gravity, in which um, we keep... Uh, the main message of, general, of quantum mechanics and the main message of general relativity together. So the main message of quantum mechanics is that uh, uh, reality is made of quanta. Mm -hmm. uh, but this means that also the gravitational field has quanta, is fundamentally discrete. So there are quanta of space-time. And uh, how do we localize uh, things? Well. These quanta are in interaction with one another. So it's through the interactions between uh, all these quanta that uh, we build up uh, space-time itself. So the quanta are not living on some space uh, and some time that are pre-established, fixed uh, there from before. They make up space-time itself. And uh, it's not, so, so it's really, I, I'm stressing the fact that it's not just about the quanta of space, and like a little chunk uh, of little pieces of volume. It's really space-time that is built up in the sense that what we call space-time is this process in which quantum space are building up and changing and uh, being destroyed and being created. And this is how space-time is made up and how our universe is made up from the beginning. I don't have to say beginning because there is no beginning, but <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> Why do you say there's no beginning? Yeah, like yeah because uh, one of the main discovery of loop quantum gravity is the fact that uh, the Big Bang, that is uh, something that appears within general relativity, so the fact that uh, if you go back in time in the history of the universe, there is a moment in which our equations start, uh, stop to make sense because uh, um, curvature became infinite, um, all the universe is restricted to a single point, uh, and so uh, we cannot evolve the universe back in time further than that. Uh, in fact, it even doesn't make sense even to talk about evolving because there is no space and no time anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but in loop quantum gravity, because of the fact that uh, there are quanta, so there is uh, a minimal unit uh, of volume, a minimal unit of space time, um, and uh, this comes together with the fact that uh, there is also a maximal uh, curvature. So when you go back in time uh, in the history of the universe, you don't find the Big Bang anymore, but you find uh, something that we call a big bounce. So there is a moment in which the universe was maximally dense, very curved, very uh, messy and compact. Uh, but this is uh, something uh, that is not singular. It's something uh, through which we can uh, uh, continue our equations and we can try to say what was before. 
Now, I think we have another student question that touches on this uh, from Vera. Hello, Francesca. My name is Vera, and I'm in grade 8. And my question is, would the universe be open and extend without boundary, or would it most likely be a closed universe? Big question, right? I like my universe to be closed. <laughs> okay, why? <laughs> For the Big, same reasons? Well, you know, Einstein thought so. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I stand with Einstein. This is... Um, this is a, a very deep question. Thank you so much for it. Uh, and again, this is not a question uh, that is uh, just coming up with modern physics. It's something that has been hunting philosophers uh, and thinkers for so long. Uh, there is even a discussion uh, of this uh, in uh, Dante's Paradise. So, you know, Dante is uh, mm -hmm. uh, the most important poet uh, in Italy from uh, uh, the 13th century. Uh, I'm Italian, so I have been... Uh, um, I have been uh, trained <laughs> learning, uh, learning uh, and reading Dante, even though you read literature and you don't realize how much uh, science there is so the great uh, uh, the great literature the the great um, cultural product uh, of each time they are always embedded they are always impregnated uh, with the science of their time um, so even in dante there is this question of uh, how what's the shape of the world and uh, there is, so there is a possible answer uh, should the, the universe be infinite or should the universe be bounded? And you can have both. <laughs> you don't have to choose between them uh, in the sense that uh, uh, think about the earth. Mm -hmm. Think uh, about what happens uh, if, you, if you walk uh, from a point to the earth, you start moving uh, in one direction and you can, you can keep on moving infinitely without finding any border. Why? Well, because the Earth is uh, curved, so you can come back to uh, your original point. And with the universe, uh, I think something uh, similar may happen, that the universe is finite, but without boundaries. If it is curved, as uh, uh, Einstein liked, uh, you can keep on uh, moving in the universe uh, uh, without any uh, finding, um, without uh, any um, without uh, uh, ever uh, uh, going through a boundary. You never hit the brick wall at the end exactly, of the universe? Exactly, exactly. Right. Uh, uh, but yet, you can have finiteness. And mm. I think finiteness is uh, something very important uh, because uh, it's when you think in terms of uh, finite quantities, a finite universe, uh, things uh, make more sense to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do the different approaches to quantum gravity offer any insight into this question? Well, I think uh, uh, loop quantum gravity is uh, a good example of a theory in which uh, finiteness uh, play a big role because uh, we say that uh, it's uh, ultraviolet finite. It's the fact that it has this uh, minimal uh, sites, uh, quanta have uh, a minimal possible value. So all geometrical quantities come with uh, a minimal value, like uh, uh, area, volumes, angles. Uh, if you try to do a quantum measurements of these geometrical quantities, uh, you find that there is a minimal possible value. On the other hand, uh, so. We talk about uh, um, ultraviolet finiteness, but the theory has also a infrared finiteness. So in the first case, we are talking about finite, finite, finiteness in the very small. And in this other case, we are talking about finiteness in the very large. So the infrared finiteness comes with the presence of uh, a cosmological constant. So if, if you introduce a cosmological constant in the theory, then the theory is well defined and is also uh, infrared uh, uh, finite. This is super important, but okay, from a technical point of view, but because when we compute the probabilities, so in quantum gravity, we wanted to compute the probability of a given geometry to transform into another one. So these probabilities are very well defined when you have this kind of finiteness. Uh, but it's also very meaningful at the conceptual level because uh, the uh, infrared finiteness 
that comes with the presence of a cosmological constant uh, implies so that the universe uh, is finite. And uh, um, so, and we measure a cosmological constant in, in the universe. So we know that it should be there. And it all fits uh, very nicely in the theory. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've mentioned that loop quantum gravity, it's, it's ideal, ideally suited for studying the early universe and, and black holes. Can you tell us why? Uh, well, yes. Uh, in uh, both cases, uh, uh, for black holes uh, and uh, for cosmology, what loop quantum gravity provides us is with a theory that doesn't have singularities. So in the case of cosmology, you don't have the Big Bang. In fact, you don't, in, in cosmology, we have a zoo of possible singularities. There are a lot of things that may go wrong in the sense that they can, have, they can assume infinite values. Mm -hmm. So um, loop quantum gravity cures all the cases in which curvature explodes, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but this means also that uh, it can um, tell us what happens in the center of a black hole because uh, we know that a black hole is an object that forms when you have a lot of matter that collapses, forms an horizon, and then what? We don't know what happens inside the horizon. We know that the matter keeps on collapsing and uh, um, condense uh, in the center, uh, getting denser and denser. Yeah, we hear of a singularity there, but is that a misnomer? It, so, the, yeah, you get a singularity there, this infinite value of uh, the energy density, but in fact, in loop quantum gravity, you don't have such a thing. Instead, you have a bounce inside right. the black hole, and you can turn a black hole into a white hole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, explain that. So a white <laughs> hole is basically just the inverse of a black hole. A black hole is an a astrophysical object such that... Uh, Everything that uh, uh, comes inside the horizon uh, cannot go out anymore. A white hole is something such that uh, everything come out, comes out of it. Um, a black hole is uh, a solution of the Einstein equation so that uh, um, describes a collapse. Mm -hmm. A white hole is the same solution of the Einstein equation just with a flipping sign, but this tells you that everything should come, come out of mm -hmm. this object. Uh, and uh, this is something uh, magical. Uh, it's magical in the sense that in order to have this, uh, you cannot just rely on Einstein equation. You need to connect uh, Einstein equation uh, through a quantum gravity region. But mm -hmm. of course, loop quantum gravity can do the job for you. So you can have a black hole that goes into a white hole uh, and you can solve the long-standing problems with black hole physics, uh, like uh, what happens to the information that uh, goes inside the black hole. Well, it can come out mm -hmm. <laughs> if you allow <laughs> the black hole to turn into a white hole. Right. Of course, this should happen uh, on very long time scales. Uh, that means that, uh, of course, uh, you see black holes uh, in the sky. Uh, I mean, nowadays we observe them uh, with uh, um, uh, with the horizon telescope mm -hmm. uh, or uh, we see the effect uh, of the interactions between uh, black holes uh, through gravitational waves mm -hmm. uh, and so with LIGO the LIGO observatory uh, so the thing that I'm talking about uh, is not changing really this kind of observations. So the fact that the black hole can turn into a white hole is something that has to do really with the, the end of the life of a, of a black hole. Mm -hmm. It's uh, solving the, the problem of what happens in the very, very end of the life of the black hole. Have we experimentally observed a white hole yet? Well, uh, people are saying that they may observe them in uh, analog systems <laughs> in the lab, in the same way in which you can make an an analog uh, uh, black hole, you can mm -hmm. also make an al analog uh, white hole. So, um, more concretely, for what concerns astrophysics, uh, uh, of course we don't observe, uh, we haven't observed yet mm -hmm. uh, a, a white hole. Um, I have tried to figure out uh, what happens if uh, uh, we have an explosion, so if uh, suddenly a, a black hole turns into a white hole, uh, and I'm trying to, s to understand which kind of uh, cosmic rays may come out of this, mm -hmm. I try to make some conjecture about uh, burst. 
like gamma ray burst or in fact ultra energetic, let's say, burst mm -hmm. that can come out of this. There is also a possible uh, relation with the fast radio bursts that are a new class of uh, cosmic rays that we are observing right now. Uh, these are all speculations uh, mm -hmm. for the moment. Uh, but uh, the point is that uh, uh, white holes are objects that we can uh, possibly study also from an experimental point of view through mm -hmm. uh, astrophysical observations. Yeah. You actually wrote in uh, in the same paper I read from earlier, you wrote a line that I love, which is, the universe is the best of all possible laboratories. It is. <laughs> yeah. Can you explain what you mean, how the universe is a laboratory that we can't necessarily create on Earth? Well, working in quantum gravity is a challenge for uh, observations because uh, I say the... Um, the main prediction of quantum gravity is the fact that if you measure area and volumes and angles and so on, you have uh, uh, discrete uh, values. But of course, uh, practically making experiments that uh, probe uh, those regimes is very, very hard. So you have to come up with a smart way to see those effects. And, uh, you need the situations in which those very, very small effects may accumulate and uh, became uh, uh, sufficiently large to be observed. So now there are two ways in which uh, you can uh, have this. So if you have a very large distances, uh, for, so if uh, you have some effect uh, that uh, involve the whole universe or something like this. So for instance, if you have some cosmic rays that uh, is uh, produced uh, on one side of the universe but travels for a very, very long time for a very uh, large space. So interacting with space time, with the quantum space time for a very long time. So then there could be accumulation of uh, effects. Right. Uh, but something we have to realize is that uh, it's not just a matter of space, it's also a matter of time. So uh, in quantum physics, there are effects that are suppressed, let's say, very, very unlikely to happen. But if you wait a sufficiently long time, then everything happens in quantum mechanics. So this is also the case with quantum gravity. If you wait a time that is long enough, you will see your quantum geometry uh, manifest itself. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, also the case with uh, with black holes. So, so black holes are objects that live for a very, very long time. So of course, outside of a black hole, uh, the curvature could be very small. So you expect uh, quantum gravity uh, effects uh, to appear when you have a very strong curvature. And mm -hmm. this is not the case outside irregular black holes. But if you wait long enough, then uh, you enter in a regime in which uh, such effects may appear and maybe be detectable and maybe be seen, uh, uh, I don't know, for instance, through a, dis a disruption of the accretion disk of the black hole, uh, mm -hmm. and, or there could be other ways. Uh, the point when you do quantum gravity pheno phenomenology is really to be smart and to try to, not to focus on direct experiments, uh, but try to look at the possible situations in which uh, effects may accumulate. You have to be opportunistic and see Absolutely. what the universe is presenting to you. Yes, exactly. We have one more question for you from Elizabeth. Hi, Francesca. I'm Elizabeth in grade seven. And my question is, what future research are you planning to do on quantum gravity? Thank you for your question. Maybe I can tell you what I hope to do with the research that I'm doing right now. Thank you so much. So uh, I say the quantum gravity is... Um, a great tool to study uh, the early universe. And uh, today we have uh, fantastic equations that uh, just uh, by giving a few informations uh, about uh, the initial state of the universe uh, can evolve the universe to the state that we observe today. So we can start with a very simple quantum state and uh, we get all the structures of the universe, that means uh, all the galaxy and all the stars inside the galaxy and all the um, filaments uh, that and all the network of galaxy ha um, that we see today. The problem is uh, we have to feed our equations uh, with uh, some ad hoc information about this initial state. So what I want to do, uh, what I'm trying to do right now is uh, to use the equations from loop quantum gravity uh, 
to predict what should be the initial state of the universe, what are the properties of a quantum geometry from which all the things that we see in the universe should come from. And of course, I'm, uh, loop quantum gravity is a tentative theory, uh, is a theory uh, that needs still to be checked by observations, but at the same time is sufficiently well defined to make these computations. So the hope is that we can develop more and more these computations and uh, try to match uh, what we see in the universe. So, or maybe it's something even more uh, challenging in a sense because um, we have uh, models in cosmology right now uh, that uh, uh, require uh, uh, a certain initial conditions for the universe. So if we have a theory that predicts some slightly different initial conditions, maybe this uh, could challenge our current cosmological models in which mm -hmm. we have, for instance, inflation and may <laughs> suggest that we have to look up for uh, some changes uh, or maybe some, even some completely different models of uh, the evolution of the universe. These are really such fundamental and deep questions. And yes. I'm just curious, how do you get students to help you with these questions? <laughs> I'm just thinking back when I was a student, if someone told me I was going to answer some of these huge fundamental questions as part of a summer internship or something, that would just seem so overwhelming. So how do you approach that? Well, I am lucky that uh, in my group there are students uh, um, working on very different things. Uh, and I think... Uh, that to try to understand the riddles of quantum gravity, we really need different skills. So there is not just one stereotypical theoretical physicist that is needed for this kind of job, uh, but uh, there are people in my group working on numerical simulations, some very, very skilled students working on numerical simulations. And this is a job that uh, if you know a bit of recoupling theory from uh, your uh, uh, quantum mechanics 101, <laughs> you can already uh, try to do um, and try to contribute. So there, there is on one hand the numerical simulations, there is uh, the more proper uh, theoretical physics work that deal with the massaging <laughs> the equations to make them more uh, computable. And uh, there is also a more uh, conceptual side. Uh, I, I have uh, um, part of the students in my group who are philosopher of physics. They work uh, on uh, philosophical questions uh, and uh, they help uh, also uh, trying to clear up the conceptual framework with which we work. So all these things uh, stays together, uh, sometimes uh, making me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty ambitious stuff. You know, let's yeah. look back 14 billion years and figure out the conditions that created everything. Yeah. It seems like very big questions. And uh, you, you mentioned the, the different areas of expertise. Yes. You, you teach uh, courses in the philosophy of science, yes. you study it yourself, and you teach courses that are sort of the culture of science, uh, the history and, and uh, state of women in physics. And yeah. women. Can you tell us, again, how all of these different pieces that seem a little disparate yeah. to us at first glance are not actually all that disparate, that they're yeah, all interconnected? I, I, for me, as I was saying before, uh, um, I'm interested to answer in uh, questions about uh, the nature of reality and uh, um, and about the universe. And I, I think that inspirations uh, come from everywhere and uh, we need to use uh, all possible tools that could be different mathematical tools uh, like uh, numerical, computational or analytical tools in quantum gravity, mm -hmm. as well as going uh, beyond and uh, getting uh, inspiration from uh, philosophy or even from art. Mm -hmm. um, for me, um, for instance, uh, um, having uh, uh, been immersed in, uh, uh, in philosophy, not just in philosophy of science, but also from a more political philosophy, mm -hmm. Uh, as something that has played, uh, I think, a role in the way in which um, uh, I understand physics and I understand science. Uh, 
I think that what I'm doing may seem very ambitious. If you think of science uh, as this block uh, which you have to understand everything, have control of everything, I don't see science in this way. I think that uh, science is this process in which we keep on uh, asking questions uh, and uh, we never have a complete uh, understanding of everything. Mm -hmm. But we need uh, uh, to keep on trying to add pieces and uh, it's like constructing a, a mosaic in mm -hmm. which um, you gather pieces here and there and then at a certain point you see that uh, they all fit together forming uh, a beautiful and meaningful image. So this is what I try to do. Uh, I got this inspiration uh, um, from uh, the way in which I see the world also from, as I said, uh, from a more uh, philosophical, even political perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, the one of the things that I teach at Western is uh, a course on women and science. Um, I have been uh, reading a lot of uh, feminist epistemology. So the feminist reflections uh, on uh, how science work, what science is, and I have got a lot of insights from there uh, about the fact that um, uh, science should be seen uh, in this uh, processual way and uh, uh, we should not fear the fact that uh, we all have different perspectives that may seem in contrast to one another, they may see conflictual, but uh, they always uh, spoke to one another. We can always uh, connect them to form this uh, uh, mosaic, I was saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, by um, accepting this plurality of point of view, we access more information about the world. We access uh, um, a better uh, understanding, a, a, a better, well-rounded picture of the world than if you, we, stay, uh, we stayed close in our own single perspective. Mm -hmm. I remember you said something to us the other day when we were chatting that uh, about arriving at the truth through the interaction of perspectives. Yes. That it's not, not you at the front of the classroom teaching what philosophy is, but you know, teaching the idea of, of different perspectives and different ways of looking at things. Yeah, well, I hope I'm able to transfer this in my classes. Uh, mm -hmm. So teaching is an art that <laughs> <laughs> require a lot of practice yeah. uh, and I'm still on my way for that. Uh, but uh, what I teach in my classes is uh, um, what these uh, feminist thinkers uh, have been developing. There was uh, a lot of philosophical work uh, done uh, in the 80s in particular um, regarding feminist epistemology. It, and uh, it was really a revolution uh, in the way in which we think about science, in the way in which we think of what it means, the scientific method, what it means to be objective. Mm -hmm. uh, one example is, for instance, the fact that we think that objectivity should come as uh, a detachment with respect to the object uh, that you are studying. And there were these marvelous uh, uh, women uh, that, scientists, uh, that uh, uh, were, uh, uh, daring to take a different approach, uh, really um, feeling the, uh, the object that they were studying. Uh, I'm, I have in mind, while I, I talk about this, uh, um, Barbara McClintock. Barbara McClintock uh, um, received the, the Nobel for uh, um, medicine for uh, her work in uh, molecular biology. And her work uh, was labeled as uh, a feeling for the organism. So a complete uh, identification uh, with uh, the object over there, uh, of our study. And uh, this kind of uh, empathy, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say, she said is what allowed her to get a deeper understanding of mm -hmm. the processes that were going on there. Um, I learned about this uh, uh, through the work of uh, a feminist and a physicist uh, who is uh, Evelyn Fox Keller. Um, she, she is a physicist uh, who then uh, started to look into the uh, feminist reflection on, on science. And uh, uh, I think everything came uh, 
back in place when I discovered that uh, uh, Liz Molin, who is uh, one of uh, the great uh, uh, father, I would say, of my field of research, was a good friend of mm -hmm. <laughs> Evelyn Fox Keller. So I felt everything was coming back uh, in place uh, that um, there was a sense in which my research in quantum gravity and my interest in uh, feminist epistemology was uh, all coming together in something meaningful. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of your course is devoted to studying the history of women in science. And as you've said, yeah. you like to take the perspective that science should be a mosaic. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the evolution of that mosaic throughout history? You, you mean uh, with respect to the presence of women? Yeah, looking at the mosaic that we have today with the presence of women and or even just or the absence is still an absence there's of still women. an absence absolutely so how and but maybe it's a slightly bigger mosaic than it was in the <laughs> past i'm i don't know i guess i'm just curious if you think that more people are starting to accept this perspective that we need a mosaic now compared to the past that's a difficult question because i think um, uh, what we meant by science in the past uh, was not the same as what we mean right now. So hmm. it's difficult to, to make a, a meaningful comparison. Uh, Can you explain what you mean by that, how science is different? Well, as I said at the beginning, uh, so science is something that was not born uh, all of a sudden. Uh, we had uh, ancient philosophers uh, thinking about uh, reality, and then uh, we added mathematics into this picture, quantification. And then we added uh, observations, and then we added experiments, uh, and then uh, we added uh, um, academia. Mm -hmm. uh, so specific places uh, where uh, science is done with respect to other places in which supposedly science is not done, and so on. So we added the layers. Uh, and. Um, so, for instance, uh, I mean, a question would be, uh, was uh, Thales uh, or uh, Anaximander uh, uh, doing science back then? Well, I would say yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. even though it's a different sense uh, with respect to what we mean today. In fact, uh, I love a quote um, from uh, a, an Italian astrophysicist called Mar Margherita Hack. In one of her, of her books, she says that the first scientist was Eve. Because <laughs> Eve, by picking up the, the apple, the, the forbidden fruit, was making an act of, uh, um, of search for knowledge. She, and uh, she was going beyond what she was told her in order to seek knowledge. So, I mean, if you think that science is about uh, this uh, uh, quest for getting knowledge about the world, it's something that is really deep <laughs> with uh, our uh, nature of human beings. Uh, mm -hmm. and, then, and then again, we have all these other layers. So in, in doing this show in general, I've come to realize that I think a lot of the interesting questions are at the intersection of fields that we would often consider separate. And I think one of those intersections that you've explored is the intersection between women in science and quantum theory. Oh. I remember you told us there are some lessons yes. that we can learn at that intersection. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, what we are learning with quantum mechanics uh, is uh, the fact that uh, objectivity in the rigid way in which uh, uh, we thought about this uh, in uh, the 1980 century is not the good one to think of reality as we experience uh, it today in our labs. Uh, so it's uh, sometimes very disconcerting for uh, scientists uh, to try to make sense of uh, what quantum mechanics is telling us, exactly because uh, it seems uh, to uh, be in contrast with these ideas of objectivity that uh, we have been uh, told at school. Uh, what we learn is then uh, um, different observers uh, can access reality, obtain a different uh, um, uh, values for the um, for the experiments that they are doing, but there is a sense in which uh, uh, different outcomes are all true, uh, and uh, and they can stay they should stay together. Uh, 
I think that uh, an inspiration to make sense of this uh, is uh, the idea uh, developed in uh, feminist epistemology that uh, objectivity doesn't come from a single perspective, uh, but uh, can be strengthening if uh, uh, we take into account that uh, different observers can have a different perspectives. So now, uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, one of uh, the problem, the conceptual problem that uh, uh, we find is that uh, uh, if uh, uh, each observer um, has a different picture, uh, is it uh, a form of solipsism? That means that uh, each one uh, of these observers is uh, separated and, uh, um, and there is no sense in which uh, we can have a common uh, uh, reality. Well, again, the answer from feminist epistemology is that uh, uh, perspectives uh, are never in isolation. They are always in a form of communication, uh, and it's uh, always by taking into account uh, all of them that uh, uh, we have uh, a better access uh, to reality. So we can talk about uh, a form of uh, strong objectivity, I would say, in an enhanced, uh, enhanced uh, objectivity mm -hmm. that is given by um, putting together all these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think this is a powerful way of thinking that uh, can help us uh, not to fear what quantum mechanics tell us about reality, but uh, to accept it uh, and try to to delve <laughs> into it. I like that. Uh, you know, the idea of quantum mechanics and quantum science can be kind of intimidating to people because it doesn't give you certainties, because yeah. it doesn't conform to what you expect necessarily. Exactly. Um, and it seems like there are lessons to take from that. If the world is inherently quantum and that's the way things are, maybe maybe it governs a lot of our how we interact with the world and how we observe and how we work together. Yeah, I think we <laughs> we we all deal with the, the fear of uncertainty and uh, and sometimes uh, the, we hang on science to give us uh, certainty. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, science is not about uh, certainty. It's about uh, accepting the uncertainty that is uh, in the world and try to make sense of it. And uh, I mean, try to quantify <laughs> the level of uncertainty that you have in order to be ready to change your mind possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, but this tell us uh, that we should not go into the world with fear. <laughs> we mm -hmm. should go into the world without fears, be ready to change. I like that. Nothing to fear about quantum science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, you know, there are many questions about quantum science that uh, I think there is a, also a general question about um, the role that science plays in society. Uh, there are uh, aspects of science that can be intimidating because uh, knowledge brings power. Uh, brings the power to construct weapon, uh, brings uh, the power to control uh, uh, people. Uh, um, I think also in terms uh, of quantum mechanics, of course, now we are talking about quantum computing and uh, what will come next, or for instance, uh, with AI, what will come next. But the, again, uh, uh, all these things are questions about uh, what we make ourselves of uh, the science that we do, what we make of the knowledge that we create. So it's not a problem with science itself, it's a problem uh, uh, with uh, how we deal with society, how we make politics, in fact. Mm -hmm. So in the end, uh, I think uh, we have to be careful and not shy out from uh, talking about <laughs> politics. <laughs> and we should not hide behind uh, science uh, in doing that. Uh, we, we have to be clear about this. Mm -hmm. Would you say that science and politics have another intersection that maybe needs to be explored more? I think, uh, again, if I think of science as this uh, uh, continuous uh, searching for uh, a better, a better picture of reality, better picture of the world. Um, yeah, of course, uh, this is uh, a, a human process in, that uh, should um, involve everybody. And uh, it should inform 
the decisions we make for our life and most importantly should inform the decisions that uh, politicians make for uh, the rest of the citizens. But I think that uh, uh, we cannot hide uh, these decisions that are political, ethical uh, and so on beyond the screen of uh, uh, scientific objectivity, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because uh, science can uh, tell us uh, if you uh, do this, uh, the consequence will be that. Or if you produce uh, this thing, it can be used in this and this other manner. But in the end, uh, the decisions regarding how we stay together and uh, how we organize uh, our life together are the decisions uh, that <laughs> that are, should be taken at the political level. Mm -hmm. I want to go to another question that was sent in for you from Jordan. Hello, my name is Jordan Kaiwanis and I'm a PhD student here at Perimeter Institute. So it has been shown that we often use words like outstanding, unmatched, or genius to describe male physicists and are more likely to describe female physicists as hardworking or careful. How does this view towards male versus female-led research affect physics? What do we do when we do science? What are the right qualities uh, of a good scientist? Uh, is it really genius that help us? <laughs> uh, or, for instance, uh, uh, if you have to stay in a lab for many hours uh, and uh, make uh, careful uh, measurements, uh, isn't better to be patient and uh, <laughs> and be precise and so on. Is this quality a feminine or a, ma a masculine one? So I think that science uh, needs uh, all possible qualities. Uh, there is not a single quality that is needed. And the emphasis of genius is just such a fake tale that is affecting us so much. I. I have seen uh, uh, many women, of course, uh, being uh, affected uh, negatively by uh, this uh, stereotype of the scientist as a genius. Uh, and at the same time, I think this stereotypes is badly affecting also my male colleague uh, who think they have to perform like a genius, uh, even mm. though, for instance, uh, they have to hide, they, they, they pretend to hide their hard work to appear as genius when, in fact, we know <laughs> that there is a hard work behind. So, so I think that uh, uh, we are never uh, built with a single identity of ourselves. Uh, I don't recognize myself uh, in many of the stereotypical uh, characteristics of uh, of a woman, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I I was acting uh, much more like the the male stereotype as a child uh, than than the female one. But the, at the same time, I recognize uh, I'm ma ma very feminine in other things. So and the the point is that we are all a mixture of identities. But because science uh, needs. Uh, energy needs uh, uh, all possible perspectives, so all possible inspirations, uh, all possible kind of tools, all possible kind of talents uh, to be developed. Um, we need uh, all this diversity. We need people uh, with uh, diverse characteristics. Uh, we need some, in my group, I need somebody who is good at coding. I need somebody who is good at making calculations. I need somebody who is good at, in philosophy. I need somebody who is just creative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I need somebody also to is able, who is able to bring all the people together to talk and to discuss things and can bridge between uh, the different uh, perspectives. So the point is that we, we need uh, all talents in science. It's not a single one. And, um, and I hope people can be both genius uh, and hardworking. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> the people who succeed uh, are uh, build up their geniality right. <laughs> with hard, hard work. Yeah. I keep thinking back to this mosaic analogy that I really like that you gave. And 
you know, we need a mosaic of different people's perspectives, but it's, as you're saying, we also need maybe mosaics within ourselves, I guess. We need to have yes. diff a mosaic of different qualities that can all be appreciated and all brought to yes. science. Yes, I think uh, really in my experience, uh, there is uh, not a single quality that uh, we have to give up uh, in our life. <laughs> Um, because uh, it can turn out in a very serendipitous way that uh, this is what makes us unique and give us uh, that uh, special uh, boost at the right moment when we need it uh, to make uh, maybe a breakthrough. Or maybe not a breakthrough in the sense that <laughs> science uh, is really uh, a, a work, uh, a daily work uh, in which uh, you make small changes and then a posteriori you realize, oh, but I have changed everything uh, in, through this mm -hmm. daily work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the interest of um, including more voices and making sure that everybody has an opportunity to contribute. We have a question on that topic from Max. So can we play that one? Hello, I'm Max. I'm a PhD student at Permature Institute. And I had a question regarding uh, women in physics, um, because I'm a co-chair of the women in physics group at Permature. Um, my question is, do you have any ideas on how you would actually improve the number of uh, female scientists in science. Um, but not only that, also a solution for them to feel like they're supported. Um, so I think it's important to increase the numbers, but also make sure that female feel comfortable in a scientific environment. Mm -hmm. Let me answer first regarding numbers. Um, I think this is very important. Uh, um, I come from Italy. Uh, I thought uh, I was coming from uh, a country with machism and so on. And then I went to the Netherlands that uh, in my mind was a, a country of emancipation of women. And I found myself to be the only women in a department of more than 60 persons. There was not a single uh, female mathematics student, not a single female mathematics professor. Yeah. I thought, okay, but well, back in my undeveloped country, <laughs> there were more women in the, in the scientific departments. And so if you look at the data, uh, there are places in the world in which, uh, that you would not expect, in which you have much more women uh, taking science courses and women in academia. For instance, one of these places is Iran. So uh, Iran is not exactly a place in which uh, women uh, have a lot of rights, but at the same time, uh, you find a lot of uh, students, uh, female students in Iran who pick up uh, uh, mathematics and physics. In fact, uh, the first field medal, uh, female uh, field medal was from an, an Iranian woman. Uh, and you look around the world and you discover like in South America or uh, in some country in um, South Asia, you have uh, you can arrive to have eighty percent of women uh, in uh, as professor in in, a, in the universities. So then you start thinking, uh, okay, so it's not about whether women are really interested in science. So uh, you, it, it's all about how society um, feel about uh, having a woman uh, being uh, a researcher, uh, having a woman thinking about making a profession. Uh, as a scientist, uh, I think there is a correlation between um, uh, the role that uh, uh, science have for a given society and uh, um, how a society value the scientific world that comes also in terms of uh, remuneration. What's the salary of a professor? What's the salary of a teacher? What, what's the salary of a, a researcher? And uh, uh, the presence of women. So. In countries where women are paid less, <laughs> sorry, in countries where scientists are paid less, you have more women. <laughs> and in countries uh, like uh, UK or Canada, in which, uh, well, uh, sci doing science is not such a bad work, uh, then you have less women. So I wanted to clarify, first of all, that it's a question that is completely a societal one. 
It has to do with inequalities in terms of power and economical power also between men and women. Uh, so in a society in which, um, uh, so that there is a balance between a society in which uh, uh, science, uh, the science work is appreciated and a society in which uh, 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 women and men have uh, uh, the same uh, rights and the same uh, uh, access to economical resources. Uh, then, of course, uh, there is another part of the question that was uh, how to make uh, uh, women more comfortable, uh, more uh, uh, in their skin, <laughs> in, uh, in the academic uh, environment or in general in the scientific uh, uh, environments. Uh, this is, uh, I think, something that relates uh, to the history of our institutions. Um, the institutions that today are dedicated to science were born out of uh, religious institutions and out of uh, um, to say uh, army uh, uh, military okay. military ac academies. So even today, if you think uh, uh, in places uh, uh, like France, some of the best students uh, in science come from a, 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 a school that is called, a called Polytechnique, mm. but this school was uh, uh, founded to create uh, the people who would have calculated the, the how to make, uh, um, how to uh, send, <laughs> uh, but always uh, with the idea of uh, um, uh, being part of uh, the military corps. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, we can uh, emancipate ourselves from this uh, uh, and uh, we can uh, rethink uh, uh, the spaces in which we do science, but I think that uh, this should come together uh, with an emancipation from uh, religion. <laughs> And, uh, and a machism associated uh, with uh, making war uh, and, uh, and uh, having uh, uh, prevaricating the others. Uh, I think uh, science has the potential to unite people, to bring people together. There was uh, an early wave in feminism. Uh, there was, uh, I'm, I'm talking really about uh, Renaissance, uh, like uh, the 15th, 16th century, in which uh, there was this idea that uh, if, uh, uh, if um, the soul uh, uh, is, um, is neutral, and because of this, uh, both men and women uh, should access equally to, to knowledge. Well, okay, this can be developed better. We have better tools to think about this. But, but my point is that the, there was a sense in uh, early feminism in which science had these uh, liberatory aspects. And I do think uh, that science and democracy stays together. So there is only, it's only by bringing more democracy into our institutions uh, that we can make uh, uh, science better and maybe bringing more science <laughs> in our in in our uh, in the organization of society as well i don't know um, so so okay i'm taking this uh, the very large uh, of course there are a number of things uh, that we can do uh, to make uh, women more at ease in our um, in our in the spaces of science of course uh, having uh, uh, more consideration for uh, the um, uh, work and family balance and so on uh, but uh, so there are a lot of things in this respect that uh, have to do uh, just to make, they have to do with um, how we make uh, um, jobs that are very demanding, uh, compatible uh, with having a family and so on. And so I don't think this is a specific uh, a problem uh, with uh, academia. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I think uh, that uh, all jobs that are very demanding have the same problem. I mean, if you ask a, of a CEO or somebody, I don't know, <laughs> having very uh, demanding jobs uh, in business uh, or in any other fields, so you find exactly the same mm. problem. So I think there is a separation between uh, just importing in academia 
the kind of things in general uh, that uh, helps uh, uh, to uh, make uh, uh, life more balanced. Are you optimistic that things are moving in the right direction in that sense? <laughs> you see, I, don't, I, I haven't answered enthusiastically uh, immediately yes. I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to be optimistic. I am an optimistic person. Uh, I don't think that our society is going uh, towards... I don't think that our society is currently in a good moment. I think... Uh, I see around us uh, uh, the rising of uh, uh, economical inequalities. I, I see tensions between uh, states uh, uh, that makes war uh, more and more uh, close to us. Uh, I mean, of course, there is uh, there are wars going on right now, but uh, states uh, seems not to make uh, the step to go towards a, a escalation, rather the opposite. So again, I sorry, I cannot answer directly uh, regarding uh, academia because I don't think that two things are disconnected. Uh, I think uh, that uh, in academia, we are just a, a sample <laughs> of the society in which we live. So we are influenced by the society in which we live. And, uh, and in this moment, yeah, I don't see <laughs> the world going in the right directions, but I have also very, uh, very strong hope. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, it, it could be a moment and there could be a new generation of people bringing new energy. And again, I think that uh, science uh, by its nature of bringing everybody together um, and, um, and uh, uh, overcoming the differences uh, for the sake uh, of uh, pursuing together uh, the, the passion for understanding the world better, getting acquiring knowledge together. Uh, I think the science uh, has this incredible uh, power uh, towards a more democratic society, a more peaceful uh, society and so on. But uh, I mean, but as I said before, uh, those are decisions that should be taken at the political level. So unless we engage ourselves uh, with the debate, uh, there, I don't think we can uh, hope for better also in our scientific uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have worked uh, many years uh, for, um, for uh, uh, committees uh, uh, for women in science, uh, like equal opportunities committees mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, of course, uh, I have been doing my activism, uh, trying uh, to make positive actions, uh, uh, supporting uh, students uh, with children, uh, or uh, I don't know, making the university more inclusive uh, for uh, LGBT people, uh, I don't know, uh, making uh, the university more open uh, and um, uh, more accessible uh, for uh, um, people coming from a low income uh, um, background and so on. The things that uh, I think these questions are really political questions uh, and uh, with which we should all be engaged. And uh, because I live in, in the academia, I'm bringing these much larger questions uh, in the space where I act and where I live. But I don't think this is, these are specific so much uh, of uh, academia. They are more general questions. And there are other questions that are more uh, uh, specific uh, of uh, of the of of science and of the scientific environment and uh, and i am somehow more focused on, on those uh, like uh, what also when i do philosophy of science uh, uh, and when i think about the history of science uh, i try to think about uh, how the specific arrangements of our society has influenced the, the kind of science that we do uh, and uh, it did, and it does today. So, and I think we can have a better understanding and a more, even a more relaxed mm -hmm. <laughs> understanding, a more flexible uh, uh, attitude towards the science that we do if we understand that uh, uh, the kind of 
theories that we have have been grown historically. So some weight that we give to a given theory or the other may come from the particular history that uh, a, a topic of research had had. And I think in general, uh, having this historical mindset helps us to uh, to relativize a bit mm -hmm. <laughs> what we are doing and be more flexible uh, to search for different uh, direction, different research directions for the future. Um, Francesca, we have a, a one more student question for you from Anna. Hello, Francesca. My name is Anna and I'm in grade eight. And my question for you is, as a female in the scientific field, what challenges do you face that males don't tend to face? As women in science, uh, even if you don't experience uh, direct uh, aggression to yourself, uh, you receive uh, daily microaggressions. And the psychologists have studied the fact that uh, uh, the effect of many microaggressions uh, is equivalent, if not superior, to just a single uh, case of strong, <laughs> explicit sexual aggression. So we, we are all uh, um, exposed to these aggressions every day. I think as a woman, we are exposed to these microaggressions all the time in our life, not just in the academic environment. We are ex exposed to this when we walk in the street, uh, uh, when we take a car, when, when, when we make decisions uh, about our health uh, uh, and so on. So, um, I think uh, that uh, every woman uh, in academia brings uh, a carriage uh, of uh, all these experiences uh, that uh, mold uh, her way of behaving and her way of thinking. But again, I think we should see the opportunities uh, of uh, our special point of view. Uh, and recognize that uh, this kind of experiences, even if they are hard, somehow can give us uh, uh, a deeper understanding on some questions, uh, maybe uh, more empathy for people uh, who may go through difficulties of other kinds. So not just uh, women, but again, people who may come uh, who may be racialized or may be discriminated because of gender or may be discriminated because of um, um, uh, economical disparities. So I've, I hope that uh, uh, there is a positive way to turn this uh, experience, uh, this trauma <laughs> that <laughs> we experience as women into something positive to change uh, uh, the world around us. I, I was just going to say, I've been thinking about this empathy issue a lot lately in regards to these issues. And I think a lot of people say, oh, just try to think what it would be like if you were in that situation. And if we think of a really big um, aggression that's happening against someone, then I think it's easy for us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and say, that's not appropriate. We have to do something. But when it's these microaggressions, it's much harder because when yeah. someone tries to put themselves in your shoes, they think about that isolated incident. And it's really hard, I think, to to develop that empathy for these microaggressions, because you really have to imagine what that's like. Yes, yeah. yeah, so um, I hope, uh, as, as you say, that these things uh, are not uh, self-evident. You may be more sensible to these things uh, if you have experienced uh, some kind of discrimination yourself. But uh, uh, most of the time we are blind uh, against, uh, uh, um, um, towards the discrimination that other people experience. Uh, so the only thing that we can do is try to inform ourselves, uh, uh, try to be open, try to listen, uh, always uh, um, try to uh, understand what the other people are saying and believe them, uh, believe the truth of uh, the experience that they are carrying. Again, <laughs> we are back <laughs> to the questions of the different perspectives and uh, the fact that each different perspective is bringing a piece of truth. And uh, if we want to understand the world around us, uh, we really need to try to seek opportunities to look uh, for all these perspectives and to learn more about the others. 
Well, I think that's a beautiful sentiment to, to wrap up on, Francesca. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We've taken up a lot of your time and you've given mm -hmm. us so many uh, perspectives and ideas. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much.